Studio DOHC, presented by Desert Oasis Healthcare, an informational podcast on health-related topics, from topical events, how we help our patients, to the future of healthcare. I'm today's host, Dr. Lindsay Valenzuela, and I'm joined by Dr. Brian Hodgkins. This is our very first podcast. We appreciate you joining us on this journey and hope to win you as a listener. We also hope that after you listen, you feel like you've been educated and share that information with others. Today, we wanna talk about COVID-19. What happened? Where are we? And what to expect? The first official case of COVID-19 in the US was on January 20th, 2020. A lot has happened since then, so let's talk about it. So three years, that's a long time. It's hard to remember what life was like before then. But Brian, what was your first memory about that time? Oh gosh, that, you know, the, the first memory, actually this week, if people don't remember three years ago, uh, we sent our first employees home from the office. So even though the first case was reported a couple months earlier, uh, we were still trying to figure out how it was gonna impact us here, both as an organization, as a community. And, and if anything, I've learned now looking back three years is how much we didn't know at the time how we overprepared, how we panicked the right amount. <laughs> but I think at the end, um, I think we have a pretty clear uh, future ahead of us as far as how we're gonna deal with this little virus going forward. And, and I remember those times. I remember uh, March 2nd, 2020, uh, our first COVID task force meeting. And we met in a room and really, I think a lot of us didn't have the foresight necessarily on where we were gonna go in the next six months. We, did, we didn't know enough about it. We were getting information in bits and pieces, drips and drabs from the CDC. And honestly, most of the information we were really acting on was what we saw on television. Just the devastation we saw from hospital rooms in China, mm -hmm. uh, the impact on France at the time and waiting for it, uh, anxiously for it to come to the US. And, you know, interestingly, we had always had to monitor infectious disease coming from anywhere in the world that might impact us here. Uh, even the original SARS virus um, and Ebola. Remember when that I remember was, that. And, and kind of like those things kind of passed uh, over this uh, pandemic starting out. And so we always kind of put information out there. This is the time though we had, it, it, when it hit home with the first cases here, uh, to me, it was just not something special. It was just something scary as hell. Something scary and, and probably would have been scarier if we'd really known what we were going to face in the next few months. And we have a few things in place when we're talking about healthcare. How do we communicate with patients through our texting, through phone calls, our website? Uh, but obviously the healthcare system was really impacted by how patients were cared for during that time. Yeah, as we said, you know, this week we actually sent uh, nearly 500 employees home out of a thousand. And, and we did it literally with a little bit of judicious thought and how do we uh, keep our employees safe and employed? We were kind of monitoring what was happening across the U.S., um, and we knew it was going to have a huge impact. We knew we were going into a lockdown, but we didn't want to lose our employees, and we did, didn't really want to lose any of our patients, and we just didn't know what to expect. And, and we're going to end up talking about this. We went a whole year before we had any real therapies, any preventional measures, and, and the one thing I remember most is working with our team, trying to source PPE and that's personal protective equipment. These are masks and gowns and goggles, <laughs> things that we at the time thought were gonna be a, make a tremendous impact on keeping our employees and our, and our community safe. And you might not realize this, but we spent, Desert Oasis spent millions of dollars sourcing appropriate N95 and KN95 from all over the globe. And in fact, we ironically got a lot of our materials from China. We actually had to send someone to China to get <laughs> these these masks and gowns and hats and gloves it, it was just crazy uh and and that was kind of scary because we didn't really know the impact of masking at the time we didn't and i know that there was a lot of back and forth on masks and and i know that that was uh something we really tried to provide to our members and to our staff was really the most up-to-date information even as it changed when we learned things about the virus and I, I think remembering back, I was really amazed we actually got PPE uh, because a lot of other organizations and healthcare entities had a lot of trouble getting PPE. And we did, you know, one thing that people don't know behind the scenes, we had to work and coordinate with our local healthcare partners. So we, with Desert Care Network, with Eisenhower Health, with Desert AIDS Project at the time, 
Um, we were all just trying to figure out who who could get access to to resources that were going to uh, be part of the strategy to prevent uh, the spreading of infection. And then I was talking about earlier, thinking about the impact on the local school, mm-hmm. sending kids home when the schools closed down. Um, you know, all of a sudden, all of our employees at home, who we thought could never work effectively at home, had, <laughs> did a, a magical job of really answering uh, that call to duty. And then we had our employees that had to show up every day and face this scourge. And I can tell you now, we had, a, out of our 1,000 employees, we have over 2,000 infections since over the three years. That means everyone got infected at least once, many people more than <laughs> once. And that's even in the face of all the therapeutics and vaccines that we had developed that came way later in the game. And, and I think that was the goal was to postpone those infections in our staff until we had vaccines and therapeutics. And preparing our staff to take care of patients really was two-sided. You had those people who were on campus, we were getting PPE for them. And you had those who were at home taking care of patients virtually and getting systems up like video virtual visits, uh, training our staff on how to use that and really training our patients on how to use that too. Yeah, all of a sudden being able to manage patients' health and wellness in their home and finding the strategy and technology that was adaptable to them and us to be able to do it effectively. And now we know uh, that genie's out, right? Mm-hmm. Our patients still like, some. many of them still like to be managed uh, through telemedicine modalities. And that's never going to go back. But I can tell you, we were seeing almost 60% of our care through telemedicine, and now it's down to about 10%. So the pandemic, as we start to see it uh, waning, uh, people still like it, but not to any degree since the safety feature of that is diminished somewhat. I think we've all learned that uh, the human connection is really important. And that was difficult during the beginning of the pandemic to really be divorced from our staff, from our friends, uh, from the community. So uh, having it as an option, I think you're right, is something we're going to keep doing for a long time because really we can handle a lot of things virtually that we didn't think we could handle previously. Now, another thing that we, Lindsay and I have been doing for quite some time, for the 156 (laughs) weeks now, I think, we were out in the community uh, on a radio show, a a local friend of ours who sponsors the show, Joe English, and we were really trying to educate the community because if there's one thing that we did know is there's a fear of both the virus that was unknown and then once the vaccine started to make uh, a big impact on being A, available and who could get it, uh, and, and just the crush of people who wanted a vaccine, just that source of protection. We were just spent a lot of time trying to correct just poor information, misinformation, and then um, I would say just sheer idiocy of people who were scared, but really uh, adopted in their own heads, just uh, crazy uh, theories on how it spread, not that it mattered, and then uh, how they were going to get uh, a traceable um little device into the vaccine so that we could follow them along like we had time to do that. If only we had that capability, I think it would make our jobs easier in the healthcare spectrum. But, you know, a question I have is, do you feel like the amount of transparency that uh, we now had to share with how drugs and vaccines are approved? I don't think the general public knew that process, what role the CDC played, the FDA, uh, how they make these decisions even down to the research and the clinical trials, how much do you think that led to people's resistance? Because now they knew the backstory. It's it's like going to Disneyland and seeing behind the scenes at Disneyland, which is not as pretty as Disneyland itself. No, it's it's, it's like watching sausage getting made through a <laughs> political lens. The reality is that most people didn't realize that the, the technology for the vaccines that were developed had really been uh, being studied for about eight to 10 years. And so the one thing when the government put billions of dollars into the technology development to expedite effective vaccines, I mean, it was really, it's mirac- it was miraculous. And what a sigh of relief uh, when we heard that there were going to be a couple of vaccines released that did have efficacy. We monitored what was happening in other countries. These were vaccines built on old vaccine chassis, meaning uh, attenuated or vir- virus particles uh, that, you know, if you look at the sp- the Russian vaccine that didn't work, the Chinese vaccines didn't work. We were light years ahead with a vaccine that had tremendous efficacy, at least against the uh, originating uh, COVID-19 virus. What's really exciting now is 
we've learned so much about that technology because of the amount of money that was put into research that now we have other options that are coming from that, ways to improve uh, the influenza vaccine, cancer therapeutics. Uh, it was really uh, a wonderful side effect of that amount of money that was spent on our vaccines. Yeah, and we in Desert Oasis, we didn't invent the vaccine, but we did invent a great way <laughs> and a process and a platform really to deliver it to the community because uh, most people don't realize just to get access to that vaccine and work in the community to actually make it available was heroic. And why don't you share with us, Lindsay, some of the things that we had to do to get the vaccines on site uh, for our community. I, I remember that day. I actually remember receiving the first vaccine in uh, January of 2021, January 8th, actually. And But there was a lot of work that went into it before then, uh, really connecting with the county in a way that we have never connected with them in the past, being able to procure a freezer that had the temperatures required to store some of these vaccines. I had never seen a deep cold freezer like that before. Uh, and the, these vaccines came in packages the size of a small pizza box. And the, the freezers were bigger than your biggest uh, fridge you might see in a commercial kitchen. So um, we started out by vaccinating our employees and our staff that were most at risk. And at the peak of vaccination, I think we were vaccinating about 400 people every single day. And for the first three months, we really made an effort not to waste a single drop. And we didn't. But, you know, I think we've learned a lot about the infrastructure of um, vaccines themselves. We've done a lot of improvements in how we store and receive medications and how we distribute them. Um, but vaccination continues. We've gone through our ebbs and flows uh, when we've seen updates in the vaccine uh, emergency use authorizations, when they expanded to different populations. You know, we really had to adjust our vaccine clinics. To how, do we, how do we make three-year-olds feel comfortable in a really very adult healthcare environment? Uh, so it took some thought, and the, one of the things that Desert Oasis really does well is our collaborative efforts between different departments, different clinicians and professions, meeting on a regular basis to go through what's best for the patient, how do we make this efficient, how do we help people understand what they need right now. Yeah, you know, I, I, one of the stories, I think I can share this uh, right now because because the person I'm going to talk about actually, uh, you know, rest in peace, passed on. But early on when the vaccines were available, uh, you know, the queue, you know, you had to qualify. You had to be a certain age. You had to have certain risk factors. Uh, and we knew everybody at that time was surveying uh, re really what was happening. And we saw that old people were dying. And yes. in fact, people don't realize um, we take care of about 30,000 seniors just uh, uh, in our Medicare Advantage population. We lost almost 700 patients to covid Although a lot of people around here are thinking it's, it was still a hoax, but we felt the personal loss we did. Uh, where we couldn't prevent. Um, and, and many of these, I would say 95% plus were unvaccinated, unwilling, or we, we just couldn't reach them. But early on when the queues where it was so difficult and everybody wanted to jump the queue, you know, you, you would fake your age, your driver's <laughs> license, like you're trying to get a beer for the first time. But we got a call from uh, a, a sitting U.S. Senator uh, who wanted um, her at-risk husband vaccinated. And so for sure, we were going to accommodate. And at the time, you know, they had to fly on a private jet down here. Uh, and we were expecting just the, the individual. I remember this. And then it turned out the plane had been filled with staff, staffers. Uh, the pilot, pilot, came, the pilot, pilot came over. Uh, so we vaccinated the entire, uh, like, crew that day, the whole plane load. And then we we told them, guess what? You have to come back. Yes, because <laughs> this is a two dose series, and and they flew back literally. You know, what was it twenty one or twenty eight days later? I, I remember that, and I remember thinking, we've created an experience that works for everybody, and it's one that kids feel comfortable in. It's one that our staff feels comfortable in. It's one that a senator's spouse feels comfortable in. A lot of that had to do with making it inviting, having really wonderful slogans and uh, post-vaccine 
photo opportunities to really get people excited about having something to protect themselves. Because for a year, we had nothing. And, and needless to say, that that opened up a can of uh, worms because then we started getting calls <laughs> from from uh, very important people all across California who wanted to come out and experience, you know, getting vaccinated in our clinic, our little our little clinic that, as Lindsay <laughs> talks about, with reverence. Well, we did vaccinate almost at this point, almost one hundred and twenty thousand doses have been given in the community. Yes, and that that's is an impressive number for for any vaccine strategy, but. Countless lives were saved, and I'm glad we were part of that. Um, now, that was great. There are some things that we probably could have done better, because I remember on the radio, I, I got some nasty calls from people that listen to this radio show that Lindsay and I are fortunate to sit on, uh, complaining about mask wearing, mm -hmm. and then complaining about, um, remember when we people would come in, we told you, sit in the garage, wash your cans. <laughs> You know, you know, take off your clothes or whatever if you're out in the community. And, and probably all that was, now we understand, was probably not necessary. Uh, you know, picking up the virus from, you know, shopping in the grocery store was not the primary mode of, of transmission. But we didn't know any better. And masking, I've heard people say, well, masks don't work anyway, Brian. That's a bunch of crap. And I can tell you this, masks saved thousands and thousands of lives. And if you don't believe it, at least... When I say masking, not the kind of mask that I've seen people wear in stores. No. At the time, you know, they would wrap a scarf around their head or or tape tissue paper over their nose. The masks that do work, obviously, were the N95, the respirators, KN95, that healthcare workers needed. And and if, if you don't think that those worked, well, we would have lost about another 500,000 doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and other healthcare providers without that protection. So we, we know that did work. We just, early on... We thought there was a mass shortage there was for healthcare providers. And so we went with plan B, <laughs> layer up. Layer up. And and I think that was a very difficult part of the pandemic uh, from a healthcare provider standpoint, that the science wasn't changing every day, but we were just learning every day about this virus that we, none of us knew existed until the beginning of January, 2020. So having everybody live through that iterative process of understanding the virus, understanding not only its impacts, who's at risk, but then the long-term effects, um, and then trialing treatments. I mean, that's really the next step that, that we went through beyond the vaccines was, okay, great, we've got people vaccinated. What do we have to actually treat somebody who's got COVID-19? Yes. And, and you know, the, so we, we have been a provider of every possible approved therapy, um, early on, and Lindsay can walk us through what that changed. The evolution of the pandemic, both the changing in therapeutics and then also ch the change in the virus has been kind of an interesting observation. Uh, early on, we saw a lot of death, a lot of destruction. When I say that, I mean people having devastating illnesses, surviving, but now long COVID and other uh, problematic issues. And now we see a virus that's kind of tired of us <laughs> as we are uh, of them. <laughs> Easy to transmit, right? Easy to transmit, but not as lethal. And so that was a, an interesting approach. And this is a virus we're going to live with. But why don't you talk about some of the, the therapies and as they kind of changed along the way. And we're not going to talk about ivermectin, folks, because I know a lot of you thought it did work. There have been three great, well-powered clinical placebo-controlled trials that showed it had no effect on preventing uh, an infection or making a current infection better. So... Uh, we'll we'll save that really for ringworm and other uh, parasitic <laughs> infections uh, in the in the future. The treatments really started in the hospital. I would say you know th that was really where the initial efforts were most important. What can we do for somebody who is now hospitalized with respiratory failure, uh, ventilators, and the use of ventilators? That of course was a a dynamic we learned a lot about which steroids might be impactful. And then we got to the monoclonal antibodies. And I think it's really interesting because how many of you knew what a monoclonal antibody was before 2020? I, I barely did. <laughs> you know, and, and I remember learning about monoclonal antibodies when I was in pharmacy school. They were relatively new. Uh, but that became where we first started. And uh, these all happened through emergency use authorizations. So that gave us the opportunity to give them to select populations based on the research that we had and 
really a lot of those were people who are more likely to go to the hospital, elderly. Uh, they all involved infusions and really trying to make sure that we have the availability in our immediate cares to provide those to the population. Uh, and, and that's another aspect of the pandemic. All of these were provided for free. So Desert Oasis took these from the county and provided them community-wide to all of the members of the community, Coachella Valley and the high desert. Um, very difficult to administer at times, wait times uh, of an hour after you get the infusion. Uh, but most of them were effective until the variants started. We started to see the change from the original virus to Delta to Omicron, which of course impacted which monoclonal antibodies we use. Uh, I think we all got really good at saying funny words like bebtilovimab and bamlanivumab, um, came up with catchy ways to Beb say it. Beb and bam. Beb and bam. Uh, and then we get to the point where now we have orals. I mean, now you're looking at this from the perspective of this is getting a lot more like the flu. And that, that should be game changer, game changer. These are things you could pick up at your pharmacy. You could pick up from an immediate care. They can be prescribed through a conversation over the phone. And although the side effects, you know, may be unpleasant, these are things that are really reasonable to continue for a five day course. It alleviated a lot of pressure on the healthcare system and allowed us to go back and take care of people who had maybe deferred some of their health care for the last three years, haven't addressed their blood pressure, uh, that nagging lump they have, uh, a cough that they're not sure why they have it. So uh, those have really been amazing to be able to go back and start taking care of people's primary health care issues. Yeah, there was a lot of deferred health uh, care. But you're right, Paxlovid, you know, all the patients... Uh, We've we've treated thousands and thousands of patients with therapeutics. Yes, uh, that that we also know uh, changed the dynamics of infection and hospitalization. It kept people out of the hospital, and, and that was really the goal. Nothing good happens in a hospital ever. Uh, I can tell that because uh, I'm a healthcare provider. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing, you know, Paxlova. The the one thing that that. I laugh about is, is people would say, well, well am I going to get better if I take this? I said, the only thing you got to worry about is what we, we heard was toilet mouth or Paxlovid mouth where everything tasted, it, it's dysquasia, but really with perversion. Yes. And we already know that this virus caused a lots of things, smelling issues, um, taste issues after you've been infected. But uh, Paxlovid did work. It had just that one disturbing side effect that people complained about lots. And, and that's a really good example of something we also went through with the pandemic is the vaccines may have rare side effects. M most drugs, vaccines, therapeutics have side effects, but they are not nearly as problematic or as common as the side effects that you're going to get from a COVID-19 infection. That was really hard to impart on people to see what's the alternative. Yeah. And, and the good thing, the other thing about the vaccine misinformation. We we we've never had millions and millions and millions of people get vaccinated never. in a short window of time, and with the observation and database that was gathered and the information from that exposure to vaccine, and so we were able to tell whether the vaccine was dangerous and if what the side effects were, and we and we saw obviously signals picked up. We saw in young men, uh, eighteen to twenty nine, that had an increase in, in pericarditis. Uh, as a side effect of the medication, of uh, uh, the vaccine, uh, self-limiting, some hospitalizations, but but not lethal in any in any way, shape, or form. So th that that's just another, uh, I think, a great point of our ability to to monitor huge populations with data uh, through exposure to this vaccine. I think is understated and underappreciated. So we did learn a lot from this pandemic, besides uh, not having to wash cans of corn in the garage. <laughs> Well, and, and I think we saw how much we learned when towards the end of uh, going into three years, we saw another health emergency with MPX or what we used to call monkeypox. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the response was so much faster, so much more directed. We had resources in place such as vaccine clinics, relationships that have been built between the county and local resources. Uh, Something that you may not know is since the beginning of providing vaccines, 
a number of us here at Desert Oasis have been meeting with the county on a weekly basis to discuss uh, with other entities, Eisenhower, Desert AIDS Project, or DAP, uh, Desert Regional, Kaiser, what are they all seeing collaborating on that information in a way that we've never done in the past? It, it really, if there's any silver linings uh, to the pandemic, that's a really big one. Absolutely. Uh, a sense of really community, um, a network really that's really focused on taking care of the Coachella Valley. I, I think that's just been strengthened through this process. And and now after three years, uh, you know, we're, we're looking ahead. We're looking through the front uh, window of this car hurtling down this freeway. <laughs> Not the rearview mirrors. We learned a lot from this. Um, I think this is a virus we're going to live with. We all agree. As I sit here today, three years later, uh, we have eight patients in the hospital with covid that could just mean they uh, were admitted for something else and they just have to be subsequently, uh, we, we swabbed them and they tested positive. So that, that's kind of the good news. We're seeing people not admitted for COVID, but admitted with. And I, I think we're still gonna see some community spread. I think we're gonna see vaccines change and model for the variants coming up. What else do you see uh, down the road as we kind of get to year four? I think we're we're obviously going to see some changes in how um, the end of the public health emergency impacts availability to the vaccines, to the treatments. It's meaning, more, meaning not free. <laughs> meaning not free. It's one of the reasons I've really encouraged anybody who hasn't gotten their full vaccine uh, primary dose and boosters. If you haven't done that, uh, now is a great time. We know how to access them. We know they're free. And we know we have the supply. I think that will change the landscape in how people access care. But I also think we're going to see improvements in healthcare. We're going to see possibly the flu vaccine combined with a COVID vaccine and maybe even something that's offered yearly. We're also going to learn more about long COVID and better ways to treat it, how to take care of patients who have really had a poor course with COVID-19 or continuing to suffer and th I think that'll be really welcome. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty clear now, um, you know, as we look back, the vaccines, you know, people say, oh, well, it didn't keep me from getting sick. And, and the, the import of the vaccine was not that. We, we, we knew you could still get infected, but it did keep a lot of people out of the hospital. It kept them off ventilators and it kept them out of the morgue. And that, that was the success story of the vaccine. We're gonna see better vaccines developed. I was at Caltech recently looking at their mosaic vaccine, which uh, your own body cells produce what looks like a virus using your own proteins and, and, and cells. It's just crazy. So that's going to come. Uh, it took me three years to get COVID. I avoided it for three <laughs> years, fully vaccinated, fully boosted. I, I'm a big fan of getting boosted every week if you can. <laughs> but as Lindsay said, the most important thing is, um, you know, I had uh, the only reason I knew I was uh, sick is I had a headache and I tested myself a lot anyway, if I had to be in public. And it was tested positive. And, and I think that's the beauty of waiting so long to get COVID is you. Absolutely. I waited till I got the, the weak Omicron B111XXB. <laughs> the Kraken. <laughs> the Kraken, at least the Kraken. So I, I think we're going to see a huge improvement in the way we're oriented towards treatment going forward, therapeutics. I think those are still being developed. Uh, we'll continue to monitor this uh, virus. But uh, after three years, I feel, oh, what a sigh of relief that, um, you know, society's back to normal. We seem to be back to normal for the most part. We do. And uh, the patients who are getting sick and admitted today, I, I think are not having the outcomes that we saw, which were so devastating at the time. Really thinking back on that time, it's hard to even remember how bad it was and how unexpected it was. But moving forward, the infrastructure that we had pre-pandemic has really just been bolstered by our experiences. And now we're in a much better position to move forward, to take care of the next response, um, and in general, to support the community and our members, Desert Oasis Health. Oh, and there will be pandemic, maybe not in our <laughs> lifetime. <laughs> But there always, it seems to be every, every couple hundred years. But uh, so we saw the past. We talked about really a little bit of the present. We, we kind of know what's happening in the future. Uh, I guess uh, the best thing we can say is, uh, you know, come to these podcasts, listen, learn, and maybe have a little bit of laugh uh, at our experience in healthcare. Uh, the one thing that's truly important is that Desert Oasis is here for you guys, for this community. 
Uh, the proof is in the pudding. Three years of response to this pandemic, keeping our patients, employees safe and well, uh, I think is meaningful as a vocation. Uh, and it's been good to share this experience with you, Dr. Valenzuela. Well, I've really enjoyed our talk, Dr. Hodgkins. <laughs> Mask up. Mask up and keep an eye on the different resources that we have available to you. Things like our website, mydohc.com. Not only do we have wonderful information that we provide to you on that site, we also have really valuable links to community resources, uh, looking at the different counties information, not only related to COVID-19, but anything that's coming up and newsworthy. Uh, we also pay a lot of attention to what is the health need of this month and how we can make your health as a community better. So we really appreciate you taking the time to listen. To keep in touch with future podcasts, make sure to subscribe, click on notifications, and for more on us, visit mydohc.com. Until next time. Stay well. Stay well.